When you are sick and in desperate need of help, you end up putting your life in the hands of doctors, trusting that they will ultimately help you get better and you can continue on with your life. Unlike most doctors, Harold Frederick Shipman wanted to see his patients in pain. He enjoyed watching his patients get worse over time and slowly, but surely he would go on to kill over 250 of his patients. Today, we are talking about one of England's worst serial killers, Harold Frederick Shipman, the Angel of Death. Is Dr. Harold Shipman appeared in court accused of killing three more women. Dr. Harold Shipman has been charged with another seven murders. In the trial of Dr. Harold Shipman, the family GP accused of killing 15 elderly women patients. Harold Frederick Shipman was born on January 14, 1946, in Nottingham's Bestwood estate. He was the middle child out of three boys from his father, Harold Frederick Shipman Sr. and his mother Vera. His parents were Methodists and from the working class. Shipman excelled as a rugby player in juvenile divisions during his childhood. After passing his 11-plus exam in 1957, Shipman enrolled in Nottingham's High Pavement Grammar School, which he dropped in 1964. He was a standout distance runner and the team's vice captain in his senior year of education. Shipman was especially close to his mother, who passed away at the age of 17 from lung cancer. She died in a way that was reminiscent of Shipman's own strategy. A doctor gave her morphine at home when her illness was at its worst. Despite knowing that his mother was dying, Shipman saw his mother's agony lessen until her passing on June 21, 1963. He went on to marry Primrose May Oxtaby on November 5, 1966, and the two went on to have four kids together. Shipman studied medicine at Leeds School of Medicine, University of Leeds, graduating in 1970. In 1974, Shipman obtained a job as a general practitioner at the Abraham Ormerid Medical Center in Todmorden after starting his career at the Pontefract General Infirmary in Pontefract, West Riding of Yorkshire. Shipman was discovered the next year falsifying pethidine prescriptions for personal use. He was given a 600 euros fine and had a brief stay at a York drug treatment facility. In 1977, he was a general practitioner at Hyde, Greater Manchester's Donnybrook Medical Center. Shipman continued being a general practitioner in Hyde throughout the remainder of the 1980s, opening his own practice at 21 Market Street in 1993 and earning a reputation as a well-liked member of the local community. He was interviewed about the treatment of mentally ill people in society for a 1983 episode of the Granada Television Current Affairs documentary called World in Action. Tonight with Trevor McDonald aired the interview again a year after he was found guilty of murder. Concerned about the high death rate among Shipman's patients, Dr. Linda Reynolds of the Brooks Surgery in Hyde spoke with South Manchester District Coroner John Pollard in March 1998. She was particularly concerned about the several cremation forms he had requested to have countersigned, which were for elderly women. On April 17th, the police concluded the investigation because they could not discover enough evidence to file charges. Subsequently, the Shipman inquiry held Greater Manchester Police accountable for delegating rookie officers to the case. This resulted in three more people being killed by Shipman after the investigation was concluded. A few months later, in August, a cab driver, John Shaw, reported to the police that he thought Shipman had killed 21 patients. Many of the elderly clients Shipman seemed to be taken care of made Shaw suspicious. I had an odd thought process and started wondering, who was their doctor? Mr. Shaw stated that following Netta Ashcroft's passing in March 1995, he initially started to worry. He claimed to have noticed an emerging pattern. Kathleen Grundy, a former mayor of Hyde, was Shipman's final victim. On June 24, 1998, her body was discovered at her residence. Being the final witness to her life, he went on to sign her death certificate, 
noting that old age was the cause of death. When Grundy's daughter, attorney Angela Woodruff, learned that a will had been drafted, ostensibly by her mother, with questions regarding its validity, she got alarmed, according to her colleague Brian Burgess. The will left Shipman with 386,000 euros, but did not include Woodruff or her children. Woodruff went to the police who launched an investigation at Burgess's insistence. Removing Grundy's remains revealed the presence of diamorphine, sometimes known as heroin, which is frequently given to terminally ill cancer patients to relieve their suffering. Shipman told them that Grundy had been an addict and displayed remarks he had made in his electronic medical journal supporting that claim. However, a police search of his computer revealed that the notes were made after her passing. The brother typewriter that was used to create the fake will was discovered to belong to Shipman, who was taken into custody on September 7, 1998. According to authors Brian Whittle and Jean Ritchie's 2000 book Prescription for Murder, Shipman may have faked the will to be caught for running an out-of-control life or to fulfill his retirement goal of leaving the UK at age 55. The police looked into 15 specimen cases and other deaths that Shipman had certified. They found that he was giving fatal amounts of diamorphine, signing death certificates, and then fabricating medical records to show that his victims had been ill. Statistical monitoring could have led to an alarm being raised at the end of 1996 when there were 67 excess deaths in females aged over 65, compared with 119 by 1998, David Spiegelhalter said in 2003. Shipman's attorneys attempted to have the Grundy case tried apart from the others, citing the purported fabrication of Grundy's will as justification. This was denied by the judge. Following six days of deliberation, the jury on January 31, 2000, found Shipman guilty on 15 counts of murder and one count of forgery. Following that, Mr. Justice Forbes sentenced Shipman to life in prison on all 15 murder counts, with the suggestion that he be given a whole life tariff to be served concurrently with a four-year sentence for forging Grundy's will. The General Medical Council removed Shipman from the medical registry on February 11th which was 11 days after his conviction. Only a few months before British government politicians lost their authority to impose minimum sentences for inmates, two years later, Home Secretary David Blunkett approved the judge's full life tariff. Despite having the option to file numerous more charges, officials decided that given the significant media coverage of the initial trial, a fair trial would not be possible. Moreover, the 15 life sentences that had already been given eliminated the need for additional litigation. While incarcerated, Shipman made friends with Peter Moore, another serial killer. Peter Moore was convicted in 1995 for the murders of four men. He claimed he did it because it was fun. He would pick up these men at gay bars, then would assault them and stab them until they were dead. Shipman disputed the scientific evidence against him and denied any culpability. Regarding his acts, he never released any words to the public. Even after being found guilty, Primrose, Shipman's wife, continued to insist that he was innocent. In the annals of British medicine, Shipman is the only doctor to have been convicted guilty of killing his patients. Shipman, then 57 years old, committed suicide on January 13, 2004, at 6.20 a.m. in his cell at H.M. Prison, Wakefield. The time of his death was 8.10 a.m. He had used his bed linens to hang himself from the window bars of his cell, according to a statement from His Majesty's Prison Service. Following Shipman's passing, an undertaker's vehicle transported his remains to the morgue at the Medical Legal Center in Sheffield so that a post-mortem could be performed. An inquest was held postponed shortly after, and West Yorkshire coroner David Hincliffe eventually returned the body to his family. Some of the victim's relatives claimed they felt cheated by Shipman's suicide since it prevented them from ever receiving closure through a confession or explanations for his criminal actions. You wake up 
and you receive a call telling you Shipman has topped himself, and you think, is it too early to open a bottle? Said Home Secretary David Blunkett, acknowledging that celebrating was tempting. And then you find out that everyone is furious with him for doing it. Although Shipman's motivation for taking his own life was never determined, it is said that he confided in his probation officer that he was thinking of killing himself to ensure his wife's financial stability after losing his National Health Service pension. Primrose Shipman was granted a complete NHS pension. Furthermore, there was proof that Primrose had started to doubt Shipman's culpability despite his repeated protestations of innocence in the face of overwhelming evidence. Shipman's refusal to enroll in classes that would have encouraged admittance of his crimes resulted in the temporary revocation of certain rights, such as the ability to call his wife. Shipman's cellmate claims that during this time, Primrose wrote him a letter urging him to tell me everything. No matter what, Shipman's death could not have been predicted or prevented, according to a 2005 investigation, but protocols should nevertheless be re-examined. Shipman's body was returned to his family, although despite several false reports regarding his funeral, his body stayed in Sheffield for over a year. Police warned his widow not to bury her husband for fear of an attack on the grave. Ultimately, on March 19, 2005, Shipman was cremated at Hutcliffe Wood Crematorium. Primrose and the couple's four kids were the only attendees of the private cremation, which happened outside of regular business hours to preserve privacy. If you enjoy these videos, consider leaving a like, comment, and subscribe. I upload videos twice a week and shorts daily.